You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. N2K has teamed up with AWS to bring you AWS in Orbit, a groundbreaking new series that explores the impact of space technology, cloud computing, and generative AI. Hi, I'm Maria Varmazas, and in this series, I speak with industry leaders to give you a nuanced understanding of how these technologies are revolutionizing sectors like sustainability, critical infrastructure, and cybersecurity. So if you're drawn to big ideas and are curious how space and cloud technologies are impacting life here on Earth, this series is for you. Follow the T-Minus Space Daily podcast to catch every episode of AWS in Orbit and visit space.n2k.com slash AWS to stay ahead of the curve. Struggling to secure on-prem apps with modern identity? Don't worry, you're not alone. Join industry leaders from Fortune 500 organizations to secure your apps on any cloud with any IDP, regardless of your environment's complexity. Meet Strata's identity orchestration platform, Mavericks. Say goodbye to the headaches of app refactoring and legacy tech debt. With Identity Orchestration, you can modernize legacy apps to use MFA or passwordless authentication in a few weeks, migrate from one IDP to another, and so much more without changing the app. No matter your IAM use case, Strata extends the value of your current identity investments. And the best part? You can try it for free today. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire to share your biggest identity challenge, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. Leadership turmoil at OpenAI. Citrix bleed vulnerability implicated in ransomware attacks. CACBOT seems to have a successor. The FSB deploys litter drifter in cyber espionage against Ukraine. Russian security firm says China and North Korea are the source of most cyber attacks against Russia. Privateers and auxiliaries engage targets of opportunity. Ann Johnson from the Afternoon Cyber Tea podcast talks about leading edge cyber innovation with Nadav Safir. And alleged war crimes may include cyber operations conducted in support of other conventional kinetic war crimes. I'm Trey Hester filling in for Dave Bittner with your CyberWire Intel briefing for Monday, November 20th, 2023. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman was dismissed by the company's board on Friday, with the board stating that Altman, quote, was not consistently candid with his communications with the board, hindering its ability to exercise its responsibilities, end quote. It was a failure to communicate and not, according to an internal memo Axios saw, a case of malfeasance. The company's co-founder and president, Greg Brockman, also quit in response to the move. OpenAI is the artificial intelligence research organization that developed ChatGPT. Ars Technica and others report that Microsoft, a significant investor in the not-for-profit AI firm, and therefore in its for-profit subsidiary, OpenAI Global LLC, was surprised and upset by Altman's firing. Rumors circulated over the weekend that Altman and Brockman were planning to launch a new AI venture. An investor-led and employee-driven attempt to negotiate Altman's return to the company failed yesterday. The final decision to move on from Altman has not ended the controversy, however. The Wall Street Journal reports this morning that more than 500 OpenAI employees have signed a letter to the board demanding its resignation, and they say they'll quit if the present board stays in place. Among those having second thoughts about the leadership change is chief scientist Ilya Satskever. He's also a board member who played a central role in Altman's firing. 
Sutzkever tweeted this morning, quote, I deeply regret my participation in the board's actions. I never intended to harm OpenAI. I love everything we've built together, and I will do everything I can to reunite the company, end quote. Late last night, Reuters reported that Altman had been hired by Microsoft. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella said on X, formerly Twitter, quote, we're extremely excited to share the news that Sam Altman and Greg Brockman, together with colleagues, will be joining Microsoft to lead a new advanced AI research team. We look forward to moving quickly to provide them the resources needed for their success. End quote. Meanwhile, after a brief period in which CTO Mira Marathi served in the role, OpenAI has appointed Emmett Shear, former head of Twitch, as interim CEO. Shear says he'll open an investigation into Altman's firing. What are the cybersecurity angles of this? Mainly, they reside in current concern over the promise and menace of artificial intelligence with respect to information security, regulation, and influence operations. OpenAI and its ChatGPT product have for months been prominently discussed for their potential cybersecurity applications for both offense and defense. Trend Micro has a brief appreciation of the threats AI enables. AI has attracted widespread scrutiny with respect to the potential it represents for the large-scale creation and dissemination of disinformation. We note in full disclosure that Microsoft is a CyberWire partner. Threat actors continue to exploit the Citrix Bleed vulnerability, CVE-2023-4966, affecting Netscaler ADC and Netscaler Gateway Security Week reports. Citrix issued patches for the flaw on October 10th, although it was exploited as a zero-day beforehand. TechCrunch says that the vulnerability has been used in attacks against Boeing, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, against Boeing, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, DP World Logistics, and law firm Allen & Overy, all of which were hit by the Lockbit ransomware gang. Security Week notes that the flaw may have also been exploited in a Medusa locker attack against Toyota Financial Services Europe and Africa last week. Researchers at CoFence describe a large malware phishing operation that began distributing Darkgate in September and Peekabot in October. The researchers believe the campaign is a successor to the CACBOT operation, which was shuttered by U.S. law enforcement in August of 2023. The new campaign that is delivering Darkgate and Peekabot follows the same tactics that have been used in CACBOT phishing campaigns. These include hijacked email threads as the initial infection, URLs with unique patterns that limit user access, and an infection chain nearly identical to what we have seen with the CACBOT delivery. The malware families also follow suit to what we expect CACBOT affiliates to use. Gameradon, also called Shuckworm, Actinium, and Primitive Bear, is the Russian threat group whose members Ukraine's SSU has identified as FSB agents working from occupied Crimea. It had a long-standing interest in Ukrainian targets, and that remains its focus, but it's also begun to show up globally in operations against the U.S., Vietnam, Chile, Poland, Germany, and Hong Kong. The threat group is deploying a new VBS written worm called Litter Drifter, which spreads through infected USB drives, establishes persistence in affected systems, and communicates with a flexible command and control infrastructure. Most of the Litter Drifter infestations observed have been found in Ukrainian systems, and it seems likely that its appearance in other countries is a secondary effect of its worm functionality. As Checkpoint observes, worms can and do spread beyond their initial targets, and that may well be the case here. Litter Drifter isn't particularly advanced or sophisticated, but it's well-constructed and effectively deployed. This is consistent with the FSB's record of deploying attacks that are good enough. The security service is interested in effects and not art. Lockbit, the well-known ransomware gang that operates with Russian permission and effectively as a Russian privateer, claims to have compromised networks at Belgium's Sabina Engineering, a company involved in supplying F-16s to Ukraine's Air Force. The Telegraph reports that Lockbit has threatened to release sensitive data taken in the attack if their ransomware isn't paid by November 26th. Sabina says it's investigating the incident and is confident that flight safety will be unaffected. Ukrainian hacktivist auxiliaries, which have tended to work closely with the country's intelligence services, have maintained pressure on Russian corporations. Solar, a Russian cybersecurity firm wholly owned by Ross Telecom, Russia's largest digital services provider, said at SOC Forum 2023 in Moscow last week that most of the cyber attacks hitting Russia originated from China and North Korea. The record reports that Solar said the incidents represent cyber espionage, the work of advanced persistent threats seeking to collect data from the telecommunications and government services sectors. 
It's surprising to see China and North Korea identified as the principal current cyber threats to Russia. Solar's report contrasted sharply with the familiar government line enunciated at the conference by Peter Bielov, deputy head of Russia's National Coordination Center for Computer Incidents. Mr. Bielov described the principal threats as emanating from the same Western countries who are supporting and supplying Ukraine. And finally, there may be some movement towards bringing cyber warfare into the framework of international criminal law. Ukrainian investigators say, Politico reports, that they've collected evidence of about 109,000 Russian war crimes. Most of them by far fall into similar categories of violations of the laws of armed conflict, mistreatment of prisoners and civilians, massacres of non-combatants, and so on, but some of them represent novel crimes allegedly committed in cyberspace. The cybercrimes are largely connected with kinetic war crimes, cyber operations in support of other war crimes, especially attacks against prohibited targets. Thus, if, say, intelligence developed through cyber operations was developed for the purpose of targeting a hospital or a school or a funeral, such collection might itself be criminal. Coming up after the break, Ann Johnson from the Afternoon Cyber Tea podcast talks about leading edge cyber innovation with Nadav Safir. Stick around. With over 8,000 threat hunters analyzing over 65 trillion signals daily, Microsoft works tirelessly with the federal government to keep our nation's data secure. This 30-plus year partnership is driving mission innovation that is secure by design. Whether optimizing your existing defenses or tackling advanced threats with AI, Microsoft gives you the intelligence and the automation you need to defend at mission scale. Let's work together to stay ahead of emerging threats and secure your mission anywhere. Learn more at aka.ms slash fedcyber. That's aka.ms slash fedcyber. This episode is supported by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat. Be honest. Do you comment your code? You know, when you're working on a project and you leave behind a small note in the code, a code comment, to help others learn what isn't clear in the code. Sometimes we leave comments for other people. Sometimes we leave comments for ourselves, a type of breadcrumbs. There's a lot of work required to bring a project from purchase to production, and the documentation doesn't always cover changing team dynamics. So the Code Comments podcast, which is hosted by Jamie Parker, he's a red hatter and an experienced engineer. In every episode, Jamie recounts the stories of experienced technologists from all across the industry who share what they've learned from implementing new technology. So if you're interested in real stories from real people going through real change, check out the Code Comments podcast. You can search for Code Comments in your podcast player, We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to Code Comments for their support. Ann Johnson from the Afternoon Cyber Tea podcast talks about leading edge cyber innovation with Nadav Safir. Today I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Nadav Safir. Nadav is the co-founder of company-building venture firm Teammate and managing partner of the Teammate platform. Prior to founding Teammate, Nadav served as commander of Unit 8200, Israel's elite military technology unit, where he established the Israeli Defense Forces Cyber Command. Unit 8200 is recognized as the informal talent incubator for the nation's renowned tech industry. Welcome to Afternoon Cyber Tea, Nadav. Hey, Anne, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. I love the history. I've been reading a book called Ancient Tombs and Lost Lives or something like that from uh, National Geographic, which is talking about the history of civilizations that we have lost and 
all of the things that we're learning about communication skills and tooling, et cetera, but the centuries that it took, right, to get to where we are today. And then you think about just what's happened since the invention of the personal computer and the smartphone and how fast we're moving, and now you have AI. So it takes me to thinking about, like, my daughter's generation. What is the world going to look like when she's my age? How fast are we going to be moving? And to your point, are the adversaries going to have the ability, because they're unconstrained and well-funded, to move faster than we're able to move? Not just in cyber, but in things like, you know, securing food supplies or predictability of climate change and orderly migration of civilizations, right? This next 50 years is going to be really, really constructed by what we can do with things like generative AI. It's going to be interesting to watch. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that the adversaries will have the upper hand in the short term. I think that in the mid to long term, I think this will, for the most part, be a very positive. I'm talking from a cyber perspective now. You know, it's beyond me to go into other aspects of this. But yeah, it's exciting. And yeah, I mean, it's just this acceleration. I think that If there's a silver lining, when you think about long term, right, so there's a race to a powerful AI between different groups and companies, but also nation states. And it used to be a lot around compute power and the strengths and the sophistication of the algorithms and the efficiency of your storage capability, et cetera, your access to data, which totalitarian countries may have an advantage over because there's no privacy issues. However, I think that we've come to a point of acceleration and to a point of possibilities where one thing which is going to be in very high demand is imagination. And this is where I think the West and liberal democracies are actually have a big advantage. And I hope that will enable us to have the upper hand both for liberal democracies versus totalitarianism and also for on cyber defense eventually, because the moral fabric of this also makes a difference. It absolutely does. And that brings us when you're talking about liberal democracies and you're talking about the world that we live in today, it brings us a little bit to regulation because, you know, we've embraced the thesis that there has to be regulation around responsible AI, privacy, data, et cetera. But regulation can also feel burdensome, right, to CISOs and other technology leaders and when governments are not as well informed and they're producing regulation that may not deal with the realities of today. So Teammate recently published this report on regulation. Can you tell our audience what some of the top findings were? And also, what are some of the recommendations to make sure we do it right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so look, I mean, I think the report on behalf of Teammates and the Village that basically commend the White House Office of the National Cyber Director on its approach to cybersecurity regulation. And, you know, in the request for information, cybersecurity regulatory, I think the report underscores the significance, you know, of adopting something which is more holistic and agile. And generally speaking, it gives sort of a substantial attention to the CISO community, their concern, and their role in enhancing cybersecurity. And to the best of my understanding on the report and that we put out and the fact that we're able to talk to the people that are actually writing the regulation, makes a difference. And at the end of the day, we're looking to harmonize regulations among different regulatory bodies. You know, at least in the United States, we're looking to engage all stakeholders, including technology providers that will shape this strategy. And more than anything else, we believe that they need to embrace an agile regulation. That's Nadav Safir speaking with Ann Johnson from the Afternoon Cyber Tea Podcast. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Ivan. Our mixer is me, with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show is written by our editorial staff, our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Trey Hester, filling in for Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. See you back here tomorrow. Tomorrow.